Matthew chapter 2, we'll be looking at verses 13 through 15. Some of your Bibles might say the flight into Egypt. Now we all know this scripture, and I want to start off with this scripture. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Now we usually quote verse 28 and 29, but I'm going to look at verse 31 for now, and then at the end of the study, we will look at the rest of it, because I think that um, we're going to be blessed here in how much God has done for us. But Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says this, What then shall we say to those things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Isn't that a wonderful scripture? How many times have you used that scripture? If God is for us, who can be against us? Now, who's going to fight against us if God is on our side? I used to have, a, and I shared this story before, it's worth repeating, I guess, but in, in, in elementary school, I used to get into a lot of fights. I was a nerdy little Mexican kid in an all-white neighborhood, had, had fr- black glasses like this back then. It was nerdy back then, not cool today. And, and so, you know, um, we were poor, so I had to tape the, the centers of it together, you know, to keep it, keep it together. And so there I was, all-white neighborhood, it's Hispanic little kid, so I was always in fights. There was this one guy named Barry, he was a tall kid for his age. He was big, and so other kids respected him because he was just, he towered over everyone. Well, he saw that I was always in fights and getting beat up, so he decided that he was going to be my bodyguard. And so Barry became my bodyguard. And any time that someone came to, to beat me up, he would kind of step in the middle and say, hey, leave him alone. So, so if, if anyone was against me and Barry was on my side, nobody could touch me. You know, in a sense. So if we know that God is for us, who can stand against us? Who can stand against us? Beautiful scripture. And it's so true. And and we can claim that as a promise in our own lives as we go out there. Now, we have to understand that that there are requirements for that scripture to apply to our lives. And, And you read it in verse 29. It's for those that are called, those that are obedient to God those that have given their lives to Jesus Christ. So we'll touch more on that in a moment here. We continue on with Matthew's infancy narrative. He's talking about the the, the birth of Christ, uh, the childhood of Christ. Uh, We really don't get too much details in the other Gospels, but only here in Matthew. And so we're taking our time as we go through this. Today's theme is prophetic preservation prophetic preservation what does that mean prophetic preservation those are big words i know i had to look them up myself prophetic in that god is involved he has a plan and a purpose and his divine power is in the midst of fulfilling that plan for jesus's life but also for our life not only is he fulfilling this plan and purpose scripturally prophetically but also he's preserving while he's fulfilling He's preserving the life of Jesus Christ from Herod who wants to kill him. And the Lord does that today with us. Prophetically, preserving our lives. Every step we take, God is with us. Is he not? He resides in our hearts. And so he's with us and he's protecting us. And we can, we can uh, take that to the bank, actually, and, and we know it to be true. So let's read 13 through 15 and get the context here. Now, when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son." Thus you get the idea, prophetic, according to scriptures, preservation of his son Jesus Christ. And so we have a picture here. We know last time that we met, we, we, we looked at the religious um, magis or wise men who came to bring gifts unto the Lord. And now the Lord is, in a sense, preparing Joseph to flee to Egypt with Jesus and his mother. And so in verse 13, they had departed. He's speaking of the religious leaders here. Uh, these men, you go back to verse 12, and being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country. And so these men were also warned in a dream to leave and not go back to Herod. If you remember, Herod had asked them, you know, when you find the child, come back and tell me so that I can come and worship him. Well, the Lord warned these 
wise men and they were wise enough to hear the warning and to obey by just leaving and not going back to Herod, which I think uh, bought some time for Joseph and for Mary, enough time that they could be warned and then also leave uh, to Egypt, as it says here. So these uh, wise men departed. Now, by by the time we get to the book of Acts, We'll see, and we notice here too that these are dreams that these men are having, or angels that are appearing, and we see that throughout throughout scriptures. But by the time we get to the book of Acts, we find that the Holy Spirit is directing man, and not so much angels. Yet we see angels actively involved in the early church, because the question arises: Is do we still have dreams, and do angels still uh, minister to us, or warn us, or even direct us? And and the answer to that would be yes. I probably would say no if we had no evidence in the book of Acts because um, Jesus hasn't resurrected yet. He hasn't ascended yet. And so we're still, in a sense, under the Old Testament while Jesus was walking among us, if that makes sense to you. And so angels were very active in the Old Testament. They were the ones that appeared to men. They were the ones that gave instructions um, and even prophetic words. And and so the angels were working along with God in his plan all the way up and through to Jesus' life, even to his ascension. Then when you get to the book of Acts, we find that, that angels also work during that time. But something happens. There's a change at the end of the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit begins to separate men. The Holy Spirit begins to direct them. And the scriptures are clear that the Holy Spirit then takes over in a sense. Does that mean that angels don't direct us? No, I think that angels can still direct us. I just think we have to be very careful that we measure or take the words of those that we think are speaking to us spiritually, whether they're angels or whether they're dreams, and we um, measure them with the scriptures. We compare them. Are they contradicting the scriptures? And if they're contradicting the scriptures, then no, we need to rebuke that word. I know of a pastor, a friend of mine, who who shared... about uh, the Lord ministering to him and an angel actually appearing to him in the morning or in the evening and really encouraging him to continue on in the ministry. And so angels do appear, and that would be biblical for him as a pastor being discouraged, and uh, the Lord really encouraged him through, through uh, a vision of an angel. So we just need to be careful. I just wanted to throw that out there. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared and Joseph in a dream. And we know that angels appeared to Mary, to Joseph, to these wise men, and even the shepherds in the field. And Matthew talks a lot about angels appearing uh, several times in chapter 1, verse 20, chapter 2, verse 13, and 19. Um, <clears throat> Luke uh, one nineteen talks about the angel Gabriel who stand in the presence of God that he had uh, sent to speak to you and to tell you of the good news to the shepherds. Uh, Luke 1.26 also talks about angel Gabriel to Nazareth and then to the town of Galilee, uh, telling him to arise and to take the young child and flee from Egypt, uh, the place at which Joseph and Mary had resided in uh, until the death of Herod himself. They fleed to Egypt. Verse, uh, the next statement says, Stay there until I bring you a word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Um, the angel will continue this conversation later, and we'll see that as we go on. So, stay there until I give you word. That's the direction. And they were to go flee to Egypt and stay there until the angel then came and gave them word to leave. And so they needed to wait upon this angel to come and then direct them. And he will later on, we'll see, as Matthew continues on in this um, infancy narrative through the whole chapter 2. Verse 14, when he arose, <clears throat> he took the young child and his mother by night. And now speaking of, uh, of Joseph here, who heard the angel, and he acted immediately in this case. He immediately arose and he departed to Egypt. So the stay in Egypt was probably short. It wasn't very long, maybe a year or two. Uh, as soon as Herod had died, uh, we see that in Acts chapter 2. 
And since there was no information about this flight in Egypt except what Matthew tells us in this account, we know nothing else as to where it was or where it could have been. Some tradition has said that it was in an area called On, also called called Heliopolis, and it was a place where uh, Joseph you remember it was taken into uh, slavery and went to Egypt and it, it was a place there where he probably dwelled for quite a while. Um, Abraham had erected a uh, elf tower or kind of like a, a Paris Eiffel Tower type of thing but made out of stone when, when Abraham was there as marking it as the place. So some believe that that's probably where, where Joseph and Mary and the child went. Um, as they were fleeing from Herod. But there's nothing really um, to say if that's true or not. We just know they went to Egypt. Throughout history, many Jews had taken refuge to Egypt because you ask, why Egypt? What's so special about Egypt? And there's something interesting that we'll see as we go on, so just bear with me. So uh, we know through tradition and through history that, that Egypt had become a safe haven for, for Jews, if some persecution was taking place, Egypt was probably the closest and the easiest path to get to. And so the Jews would quite often flee traditionally to the country of Egypt. Egypt was very well built. It had considerable amount of Jews that were already there within that area and other areas, as many as a million Jews in Alexandria and the surrounding areas. It was a trade center. Tourists went there. And so there was enough money, there was enough housing, apartments, and places to stay that, that Joseph and Mary could actually come in and kind of mingle with all the terror, uh, with, uh, terrorists, with all the tourists, you know, there. And, and that's what's going on in the world today, right? <laughs> terrorists. But with the tourists, so the terrorists, Herod, could not come in and, and kill them. And so it was a, an ideal place for them to flee to. Um, God has everything in control. He knows exactly where we need to be. He knows exactly the timing and the place uh, and so forth. So we can depend on that. Um, verse 15, he says, And was there until the death of Herod. Now, Herod had passed away probably about 4 B.C. We see that in verse 20, uh, his, his passing away. And at that time would be when the angel would appear to Joseph and then redirect him to go down to Nazareth. Now, until his death, until that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I call my son. Now, this is an important statement here that Matthew is making when you think about this, that scripture might be fulfilled. Okay, so if scripture is going to be fulfilled, what scripture is going to be fulfilled? Well, we find it in Hosea chapter 11. So you might want to write that in your Bible. Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. This is what it says. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Now, if you had just the New Testament, I mean the Old Testament and not the New, and you read Hosea 11, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. What story would you have thought of if you would have read that? You probably would have thought of a story that took place in Egypt when a young child was put in a basket and was let off on the water to the pharaohs to Egypt to be taken care of. You would have thought of the story of Moses. And so that's an interesting scripture here, but it's a prophetic scripture, Matthew's saying. This is a fulfillment of Jesus Christ who fled to Egypt, but then is going to leave Egypt. Leave Egypt. We see here, I called my son. The first time that Matthew uses the word son there in reference to Jesus Christ. Who is Jesus the son of? The son of God. And so referring to this exodus, <clears throat> and you probably already noticed this as we have been um, teaching on this this morning, that there seems to be a kind of Israel-Jesus typology here. Israel in that what Israel had gone through during the exodus situation, during the bondage into Egypt, and then the life of Jesus himself. Jesus fulfilled this by being called out of Egypt, as I said earlier. You go back to the Old Testament, and you remember the story of, of Moses, and how Moses was born, but at that time, Pharaoh realized that the Jews were increasing in number. And pretty soon they would outnumber the, the Egyptians. 
and there was worry that that they would outnumber them and they would rebel and they would take over uh, their kingdom and so what they did was a form of abortion in a sense and so they took uh, every young child and they would kill them and so they went through the land and they would murder the young children the, especially the men who would be produced um, and that's how they kept the numbers down so with Moses what they did was because that God's province prophetic preservation he laid it on the heart of Moses' family to take him and put him in a basket and they took him down the Nile River and they floated him away. And who found him? Egypt. Pharaoh's uh, sister. And they took care of Moses and, and Moses was raised within that system of Egypt. And so he went to college and the college that they had at that time became very wise in the world and so forth. He was among them. And so like Jesus too, who was a baby, and God was preserving him from being killed by Herod. You see the typology? And then Jesus flees into Egypt. Now, Egypt is a type of what? The world, right? It always reminds us of the world because in the world, we are in bondage to the world. The Bible's very clear that we are in bondage to the world. Well, what do you mean bondage to the world? Well, we are living in the world or among the world, the world system, the world philosophy, the world's teaching, whether it's humanism, socialism, capitalism, whatever, whatever that teaching is, atheism, whatever that teaching is, we're living in that world and that world has us in bondage. You're not really free. We talked a little bit about this at the men's breakfast. See, we think freedom means I get to do whatever I want. That's not true freedom. That's not true freedom. True freedom, defined biblically, means that you are free from sin. You are free to live righteously. Try to live righteously. A person that, that lives in this world, that is governed by the world system, can't live righteously. They just can't. They're addicted to the world. And so they're in bondage to the world. They're in bondage to sin. It might be money. And so they work, 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 because they want, 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 want. And they can't stop working, because the more they work, the more they get, the more they want. And so they're in bondage to that world. It could be movies. It could be pornography. And they're involved in there. Try quitting. And you'll see whether you're in bondage or not. You're in bondage to sin. To sin itself. Sin is missing God's mark. And you will continue to miss that mark because you're in bondage. Now you might say, no, I'm not. I'm not in bondage to any. I get to do whatever I want. Yeah, you get to sin. And that's why you're in bondage to it. Try to stop sinning. Try to stop watching pornography. Try to stop smoking. Try to stop drinking. Try to stop taking drugs. What happens when a person stops taking drugs? They go to withdrawals and eventually they say, I just can't do this and they go right back to it. It's called an addiction. That's what we call it in the world. We call it in bondage to sin. And so the Bible's clear that Egypt is a type of the world. The Israelites were in bondage. If an Israelite tried to escape, what would Egypt do? Go and grab them and bring them back. Either kill them, or bring them back and put them under harder labor. Remember when Moses came into Egypt, and he began to say, let my people go, speaking for God, saying, my, my God is going to remove his people from the world and bring them to a new land. And, and the more that, that Moses said, let them go, the more Pharaoh said, no, they're mine. They're my slaves. I'm not going to let them go. And, and you see the battle of the flesh and of the spirit battling there. A, a person that's in bondage to sin is battling. I, I want to stop doing this, but I can't. There, there's something that's keeping me here, and you realize, boy, I really am in bondage to this. People who watch soap operas. Uh, my mom, every once in a while, likes what they call um, novelas. I think it's in Spanish. You know, Try to not watch it. And you're going through withdrawal. Uh, what happened next with so and so? And what did they do? Oh, I, I can't take it. And you go, go turn it on, because you're in bondage to it. See, true freedom, true freedom, gives you the strength to say, I don't need to watch it. That's why I can say, I can drink. I can drink as a pastor. I can go out and I can have a beer, and be perfectly fine with it. And you're going, well, wait a minute. Well, that's wrong. No, I'm not in bondage to it. But see, I choose not to. See, I have a choice to not do it. I'm free from it. I don't have to like I used to. And so I don't because I've chosen not to because I'm free in Jesus Christ. He has set me free to live righteously. 
And so we see this typology uh, of Moses. Now, now Moses goes in there and, and he says, let my people go. And we know all those plagues that take place and the battle that's going on. And, and that really reveals to us the battle that goes on in our own lives with the spirit and the flesh, that it is a battle. And so when Paul talks about that in Corinthians about repentance, what true repentance is and what sorrow is, um, it's a battle because uh, earthly sorrow is one that says, oh, I'm sorry I got caught. I'm sorry that I offended you. I'm sorry, but I'm going to still live my life the way I want to. I may still offend you because I still believe that, but I'm sorry you're hurt. That's worldly sorrow. Spiritual sorrow is that you repent. As I mentioned Wednesday night, a lady who had uh, been going through very hard times. I just read this article. Uh, She had been eating at a pizza place and she knew she had no money. So what she did was she wrote a check knowing that that it would bounce. And so she wrote the check, gave it to the guy and it was $20 she figured. And uh, she walked out. Well, it bounced. And so she didn't have to pay for the pizza. Well, 13 years later, and she has eaten at this place periodically and she's always felt guilty going in there, sitting down, having pizza and paying for it. But she's always felt guilty because she had not paid for it then, knowingly gave a check that knew that it bounced. She knew that it bounced. And so she felt like, I need to go tell the guy I'm sorry. I I need to tell him that, that, that I did a wrong thing, but she would always get fearful and leave. Well, 13 years later, she finally got enough nerve that she went to the person and, and she said, I want to apologize because I wrote a bad check 13 years ago and I want to write a check to you right now for $20 plus 30% interest, and so it came out to 50-something dollars, and here's the check. That's true repentance, because not only was she sorry, not only did she ask for forgiveness, but she also made it right. That is true repentance. That's what God wants from us, true repentance. Uh, We can see that with the Israelites. Um, They kept saying, let us go, and we wanted to go, but there was a point in their life when they left, and you remember there at the Red Sea? And they were challenged now. Here's the Red Sea. And and by the way, they could have taken another path, the Bible says. I don't know if you remember reading that. There was another path, but God actually led them this way because he had another plan. The other way was a quicker way, an easier way. There might have been a couple of battles with some nations, but they would have been able to get right to that point a little bit quicker. But God says, no, I don't want you to take the easy way out. I want you to have faith and trust in me. And so they there were with their backs against the Red Sea and Pharaoh coming at them. And that was the challenge of repentance. We see their hearts. Uh Uh-oh, if we would have stayed then we wouldn't have come out here and we wouldn't have been buried in the ground, you know, all this way to what, die and get buried out here? And they started having second thoughts instead of trusting in God and knowing that God was going to get them through, especially after 10 plagues, after witnessing what God had done to Pharaoh and even killing the little child. Now, killing the little child, because you remember the the last words of Pharaoh was that, look, we will kill your children. And so Moses told Pharaoh, because you said that, God will now take your firstborn. And death angel came, and any doorpost that had the blood, remember, Moses told the Jews to put blood on their doorposts, signifying the crucifixion of Christ. The doorposts, a wooden post in the cross, take the lamb's blood, put it on the post, and when the death angel comes, he will see the blood and he will pass by you, but he will kill every firstborn of the Jews. And that's exactly what happened, a typology of Christ's resurrection, or death and then resurrection and deliverance from death itself. They saw this. And yet they were there without faith in Christ or in God, fearful for their lives. And so God once again delivered them by dividing the Red Sea and allowing the people to go through the sea and watch what God did with Pharaoh. Now, as they crossed the Red Sea, they entered what? Into the promised land into the land of Canaan. Now, some people have mistakenly thought, well, see, now that's, that's, the, that's heaven. Uh, that, that's where everything starts going right. Well, no, 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 no. That, that's the actual Christian walk in the world. That's now our victorious walk as we conquer the flesh, as we live day by day, as we 
uh, trust in God for our daily provision because we know as they crossed the Dead Sea, now they needed to, pr- to trust in God for water. They needed to trust in God for food. They needed to keep their eyes on, uh, on the cross in a sense because as they went through the, the, the serpents, those that kept their eyes on the cross were saved. Those that did not perished. And so it's their daily living. Now we see this in Matthew chapter four and we'll get to it sooner or later. But we see Jesus was called to relive this wilderness temptation in Israel. So there's Israel wandering in the wilderness, and they wandered because of their lack of faith in going into the promised land, and so they wandered being tempted for 40 years. Jesus relived that, and we'll see it in Matthew chapter 4, the first temptation when Christ went up to the mountain, and who tempted him? Satan himself. And you remember that temptation, Matthew 4 says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And that's exactly what happened with Israel. The Spirit led them into the wilderness and they were being tempted. God was testing their faith. God does that with us today. He tests our faith. You see, God is good, isn't he? God is good to us. If God is for us, who can stand against us? He definitely is good for us, and he hears our prayers because he loves us so much, but he also wants us to live our life for him. He really does. As we're walking through the wilderness, Satan comes and he tempts us with things, whatever that temptation may be in your life, whether it's money, whether it's status, whether you want to be the boss and have all the authority, whatever that is, he tempts us with life, and we are challenged to either give in to him or to give in to the Lord. So Jesus is also tempted like the Israelites. And it says that he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Afterwards, he was hungry. Now you remember the Israelites, they were what? In the wilderness for how long? 40 years. <clears throat> and there were times where they were hungry. And God said, you have to trust in me. He, he brought what? Manna from heaven. But he told them, only take so much. And on the seventh day, you let it rest. You leave it alone. You don't take any of it. There were always requirements for God's provisions. And so we see Jesus being tempted and he's hungry without eating 40 days, 40 nights. And afterwards, when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones into bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And so Jesus is our example in our Canaan walk in this world. We are to live by the word of God. That's what Jesus said. We will be tempted by the enemy just like Israel was tempted by the enemy, but we need to keep our eyes on what God has said in his word. Matthew links Jesus' movements to Egypt, and then later on he moves to Nazareth, and then later on to Capernaum. So when Herod passes, he dies, the angel will come and tell Joseph, it's time for you to leave Egypt. Just like Moses went to Pharaoh and said, it's time for the Israelites to leave Egypt. And they left, and Jesus left. And he goes to Nazareth to fulfill another prophecy, and then he goes to Capernaum to fulfill another prophecy. And each of these, these movements, Matthew identifies the fulfillment of Scripture, exactly as God had spoken it. So God's plan unfolds before Joseph's eyes and before our eyes. How is God leading you? How is he leading you? How is he leading you today where you're at? Because he wants to lead us. He has a prophetic plan for our lives. He really does. I remember when my pastor decided to have a liver transplant. And so the board and elders and those involved in the church got together and they said, what are we going to do while you're recovering from a liver transplant, which would take eight months, eight months to recover. And at that time I was an assistant pastor. And so they decided that I would run the church with the help of some of the pastor board members that were within the community nearby. Also with the help of other Calvary chapels that would support financially while he was gone because they knew that the church would probably uh, get smaller because people have a tendency of following people 
And sure enough, as soon as he was in the hospital, the church got smaller because they were here not for the word, not for God, but they were here for him. And so it got smaller, and the ones that were, were faithful stayed. And so that financial help helped. Well, at that time, I worked for Southern California Edison. And this is how God puts things together in our lives and in your lives. And so Edison decided that they were going to work for tens. You remember when, when um, the world, corporate America, uh, were concerned about pollution and bringing that pollution down? And so they, they figured if we cut the, the driving time by uh, make, giving people the option to work four days a week and have Fridays off, then hopefully the pollution will go down. And so they offered that to people. So now I was working Monday through Thursday. I was off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, so I could work three days at the church and and maintain it. Well, it it didn't stop there. In the first time in history, and the last time in history, Southern California Edison decided, because it was during the deregulation, some of you that might remember that, when Edison went through the deregulation, right after the phone company went through deregulation, where where outside manufacturers wanted to get a piece of the pie because they felt Edison had it all, and so it started to cause deregulation. So Edison wanted to save money. So they offered what they call a VP, time without pay. You could take an extra day off, and you wouldn't get paid, but we wouldn't uh, mark you as um, a part-time employee. We wouldn't re- take away your benefits. You would just would not get paid. And so even though I was only working 30 hours a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I took the, the, that, that um, day off. Uh, so I was now able to work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, four days now, almost a whole week at church. And so I did that. Now, now here's the thing that just blows my mind every time I think about it. Because you might think, well, that's coincidence. You know, God wouldn't do that just for you. I, well, I don't think he did it just for me. There was a lot of, there were 18,000 people that worked for, for Edison. So they all got that opportunity and God was working in their lives, I'm sure. But the day that he came back on that eighth month, and he began to come back and, and began to teach again, Edison decided that we're no longer going to give you the day off and that four tens were going to stop. So when, when something like that happens, you just go, wow, Lord, were you in control or what? That's prophetic preservation. That's prophetic preservation. God does that for all of us, for every single one of us. Not because I'm special, and please don't take it that way. It's not about me. It's about God's work and his plan and what he wants to do. And that's why I'm so adamant about us serving in the kingdom of God and applying ourselves with the gifts that God has given to us in this ministry. This ministry needs to grow. It should be growing. It should be in a different place than it was last year. And we are in a different place, strangely enough. I don't understand it, but we are. But we should be continuing to grow because a body grows naturally. It just grows naturally. How is God leading you? Now let's go back to Romans. I want to share with you what God has done for you. Romans chapter 8. That's right in your Bible. I don't mean right in it, but to the right of Matthew. 8 is a beautiful chapter, especially the last part of it. We'll look at verse 18. This is what Paul writes to the Romans, and it's really to us too. He says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. Jesus was about to suffer at the hands of Herod, but God had a glorious plan for his life. The Israelites were suffering, but God had a glorious plan for their life. Paul says, We may be suffering at this time, but God has a glorious plan for our lives. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the Son of God. That is the second coming of God. Don't we wait for that day? Aren't we anticipating that day? Some of us are praying, Lord, please come back. I got nothing else to do. I'm just waiting for you to come back. For the creation was subject to futile 
not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Even the world itself is in bondage to corruption. It is decaying, and it can't do anything about it. For we know, verse 22, for we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. And not only that, or not only they, but we also who have the first fruit of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Again, the hope of heaven. Our bodies are aching to one day be there and finally be whole. Uh, How many of us, when we sin, how many of us, as we're living get tired of being in bondage to some of the sin that we've involved in because we're still in bondage to a lot of it and yet we should be getting tired of it and so we then cry out god take us home so that we can be complete and we will stop sinning for we were saved in this hope but hope that is seen is not hope for why does one still hope for what he sees but if we hope for what we do not see then eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, there are times where we don't know what to pray for, and so what do we do? We just go, oh, Lord, oh, God. I need you, Lord, and we just groan. And for some reason, the Spirit knows exactly what we're groaning for. He knows exactly, and God hears us. Now, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, is because he makes intercession for the saints. That's God praying for us according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who, what, love God. That's the scripture you should highlight, and, and most of you probably already have memorized. All things work together for good. For who, though? To those who love God. To those who are called according to his purpose. Prophetic preservation if you are a believer if you've asked christ jesus into your heart you are under that prophetic preservation you should be loving god and you should be call, being called to his work his purpose his plan for whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to who to the image of his son that we that he might be the firstborn among the brethren moreover whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. The process of salvation. You are saved, you're being saved, and you're going to be saved. You're going to be glorified. What then shall we say to these things? Uh, isn't it glorious what God has done for us? And then Paul gets a little excited here. So what shall we say about these things? This is too wonderful. If God is for us, who can stand against us then? Wow, amen. Right? Right? Look at what it says in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, God didn't spare his son, but he delivered him up for us all. Yes, even the crucifixion of his son was his prophetic preservation of us. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So if he gave us his son freely, how much more will he give us? He'll take care of us in all things, he said here. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That's us, God's elect. Who's going to bring a charge against us? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, he is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, shall persecution, shall famine, shall nakedness, or peril, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor death, nor any created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is love. That's what God has done for us. He is in your life and he has a plan 
and it is unfolding. No matter how hard you think it is. Here, here we're living in Mariloma. We're not living in Beverly Hills. And yet God has a plan for your life right where you're at. He really does. And you get the opportunity to minister to Him. To glorify Him in the situation that you're in. And so if God has a plan for your life, if God is protecting you, He is fulfilling the scriptures, then we can trust Him, right? With our very lives. We shouldn't fear. We shouldn't worry. We should just know, Lord, let your plan unfold before our eyes. Amen? So trust in God because He loves you so much and He has a plan for you.